Good afternoon. Oh, I was looking forward to whoever was supposed to, Annetta, uh, I guess is her name, was supposed to speak today. Um, but um, I was looking forward to that 38 years of boot camp. Um, but uh, can't get away from the, the talk of warfare today because I'm going to discuss um, are you fully dressed for spiritual warfare? If you'd open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 uh, through 18, we're going to discuss. And um, I was always interested in being a soldier for the Watchtower um, for 30 years. The Lord gave me an interest in researching this spiritual armor of God. But what I want to do, first of all, is look at the context of what Paul was speaking about. He was talking about the relationship of uh, Christians to uh, one another. Uh, in chapter 5, he was talking about marriage. Um, he was talking about parents and children, servants and masters. And it's interesting to note that he was giving instructions to children right before he talked about that spiritual armor. Like, really, they need to know how to be disciplined in spiritual warfare and to be equipped to fight the enemy on their own. And so in preparing for this material, I, I read some really vicious and horrible history of the Roman soldier's life. Uh, how much damage that uh, they could do with their shoes, you know, those long spikes, what they could do to an enemy, or that sword that was like 19 inches long, real sharp, penetrating, two inches. All you needed was two inches into that intestine and pull it out, and they would be dead. It would be fatal to them. Sometimes they would even have a little tip at the end of the sword to just rip your insides out. And then they'd have a, a, a lance, and they'd throw it real close range, and then when they knocked you down and killed you, they'd take that sword and they'd chop your head off. Ruthless. Vicious. But you know, I heard it once said, that the Lord can take something terrible and horrible and make it into something good. He could glorify himself. Isn't that what he did? He, he, he inspired Paul to write about this Roman soldier's uh, equipment for our benefit, to protect us, his children. Isn't that exciting? Well, let's look at verses, uh, let's take a look at verses 10 and 11. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Well, what does this wiles word mean? And whatever your Bible says, mine says wiles. It comes from the Greek methodus. And meta, with, odos, road. Well, 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Lest Satan should be taking advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. The Greek for devices is nomada, which is for, it means the mind or it's the intellect. So we have a road to the mind. We have the idea of a deceived mind. We have the, Satan's road of deception to the mind. And isn't that what we have with the JWs, mind control? He controls our mind. I went to uh, one of the kiosks that they have now. You know, you have the, the literature out in the street and you talk to them. And I went uh, to a couple and um, I basically said, you know, I heard that Jehovah's Witnesses don't uh, believe the whole Bible's for them. And that usually gets the ball rolling. And, um, oh, no, we believe it's all for us. And, and so I was talking with them, and they were pretty much, you know, trying to get rid of me. Um, you know, we'll read this. We'll look this up. You know, here's our website, you know. So I went across the street, and I talked to those witnesses over there. And they were watching me. And um, 
And they said, well, we saw you, on, we saw you over there talking there. And um, they said, well, what did they say when I asked them a question? I said, don't worry about what they said. I'm asking you what you believe. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they believe. What do you believe about what I'm asking about this particular question? And they gave me an answer. This is what we're talking about. Mind, what Satan, this road that Satan has towards our mind. Fear is a big thing, too. Whether it's with the JWs or anything in our life. What about David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17? Israel was afraid. Forty days, it says. Morning and evening. It could paralyze you, fear. War and warfare. Well, let's talk about that. It's taken from the word stratos. Now, in the New Testament, this word is used a few times, uh, and it's referring to mental bondage. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5 says, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So it's our mind. It's what we think about. What are we thinking about? Well, James 4 and 1 Peter 2 talks about a war. It talks about a war against our flesh. Now, this is, this is a real uh, interesting point that I, I came across in, in researching this. And um, I just want to say, personally, I've put a little personal experience or testimony in, in between here. Um, a few months ago, I uh, was walking across the street and... Um, found this. I, I saw something laying in the street. And, uh, boy, I thought, that looks, that looks green. That looks like money. Boy, and I, I, you know, safety first. I want to make sure I don't get hit by a car, right? So I went over and, whew, sure enough, huh, it was a $20 bill. Whew. Well, what do you think my first thought was? What? Tithe? No. Anybody, <laughs> anybody think like me? I want to know who thinks like me. No, I didn't think that either. Nope. Who did it belong to? I thought about that, Janelle. Who did it belong to? But second, that was my second thought. What was my first thought? What should I buy? New pair of shoes? No, you're not. Nobody thinks like me. I'm disappointed. <laughs> um, is there any more? <laughs> is there another $20 bill? Is there another dollar bill? Are there some quarters on the street? Am I missing anything? That's what I thought. <laughs> well, what's the point of that, though? The point is... What took over quick? Greed. I was greedy. I found $20. It was, my, it was actually my weekend of my birthday. And I found $20 and I wanted more. And that's what evil forces do to us. They can destroy us if they latch on to our sinful nature. And we all have sinful nature. We're saved by Christ, but we're still sinners here on this earth, in our flesh. Jesus said in John 14, 30, he said, the ruler of this world is coming in and he has nothing in me. He has nothing in Jesus. He is sinless. That's why he came and died for us. The enemy cannot latch onto any sin in Jesus, but he can to us. He can to our flesh, can he? So let's read verse 12. In just the beginning, it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Well, we don't wrestle against people. Um, the enemy could use people against us. It's not really flesh and blood, not actual people. Our real adversaries are unseen spirits, and they can't do anything unless our flesh agrees and cooperates with them. Isn't that true? We must deal with our flesh before we can deal with the devil. Romans 6.6, 6, 
says, our old man was crucified with him and the body of sin, that the body of sin might be done away with. Now, what about dead people? Do they have the capacity to respond? We can curse at them. We could try and tempt them. We could try and deceive a dead person. But if they don't respond, it's unsuccessful, isn't it? And that's how we should be. If we read, continue to read verse 12, it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against. How many times is against used here? Four times. Against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Just briefly, principalities, those that high, they, they carry the highest rank of position and authority. Powers, if I'm saying this Greek, uh, I'll try with the Greek. Uh, the powers are the exo, exia, exia, which means delegated authority that they receive from Satan. And then you have the rulers of the darkness of this age. And that's the cosmo crateras. Cosmos, the order, the arrangement of things. Kratos, the raw power. Cosmo crateras, it's a military term. Having to do with discipline, having to do with organization, commitment. Satan is organized, but we have the greater one living in us to match that enemy's power. And then the last one is the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Those are these vile and vicious and malignant things that we see happening today. Well, let's go on to verse 13. And it says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. To stand in strength and power and confidence. Your head held high. You're not slumped over in defeat. We're in a critical battlefield in our mind. What does he want to attack us on? It could be something different for every one, in us, every one of us. If we're thinking about what is he attacking us on now? Think of something in your life. Is it finances? Is it your business? Is it your marriage? Is it your emotions? Is it your family? Well, what does verse 14 say to do? Again, what did verse 13 just st say? It said to stand. 14 says, stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. So we have standing with our waist girded with truth. And that brings us to the first piece of armor. We're dressed for, with a loin belt, if we could have the loin belt up there. That's mentioned first. Um, yeah. He has his sword there. Well, first of all, it's very vital because we have this, the shield will be attached to that. The sword was attached to the belt. The breastplate was attached to the clothing, it was all kept in place. It was all kept in place by that belt. Isn't that vital today in a man's clothing? Usually when a man is dressed up, uh, usually notice his jacket or his tie or uh, his shoes. Uh, you don't usually notice his belt. But what happens if a man takes his belt off? His pants fall down. His shirt becomes untucked. And then he's trying to, you know, get it all together. He drops his, his shield, you know, and then you're pretty soon you're on the floor, right? <laughs> Doesn't it all start with the belt? How important is that? Spiritually, it's truth. What is truth? What is the truth? We had the truth, didn't we? Truth is the written word of God that supports everything in our walk with life, with God. 
Without God's word in our life, our battle is over before it even began. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. There's a famous preacher. Uh, He was on Fox this week promoting his new book. Uh, He has a lot of books. He's very famous. And uh, has the title somewhere along the lines of The Power of I Am. Questions like were tweeted there on TV, like, how can I get close to God? I'm looking for life's ans- uh, the, the answers to the life's questions. They, they were the questions. They were directed to him. And you know what he said? Well, just acknowledge God. Acknowledge what he's doing in your life. It's about you. Recognize who you are. Always take him with you, wherever you're going, whatever you're meeting. Acknowledge God. You know, not once did he say to read the Bible. The emphasis was on I am. The only I am I know is the one in Isaiah 44 and Revelation 22, Jesus, the great I am. I'm not saying that people shouldn't read the book. I'm not saying that. I I love to read everything. I read everything I wasn't supposed to read as a JW. That's how we know what's out there. In a sense, we need to know what the enemy, and I'm not saying he's the enemy, but I'm saying we need to read God's word. And if someone is not putting that first, there's a danger there. And it's anything, the enemy will use anything. The enemy doesn't have to take something way back here, up there, down here. He just has to get us off track, just a little bit. That's all that matters. All right, let's move on here to the breastplate. Verse 14. It says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness. I wanted to read a little bit from the JW uh, literature because it just wouldn't be complete without that. Um, The Insight on the Scriptures book, two volumes, I remember that, 1988, just like yesterday. Boy, they were were big books. What a wealth of knowledge. Um, The armor was mentioned. I thought this was really the first time I I read it. And it said about the uh, breastplate, it says, a literal breastplate protected vital organs especially the heart. The need of righteousness as a protective breastplate for the figurative heart is evident because of the heart's sinful inclination. That's all. Well, it is the heaviest piece of equipment made of metal or brass, and the defensive weapon protects us from the blows of the enemy. But how does the enemy do this? Well, he brings guilt to our mind, doesn't he? He brings lying accusations. He brings out our failures. You call yourself a child of God? Look what you just did. Look at your loved one suffering. Your father doesn't care about you. Lies that can fill our minds and wear us down, right? We read stand twice, stand proud, stand victorious. Now, this is not the pride Proverbs speaks of when it refers to pride as an abomination, and it is. It's the first one mentioned in Proverbs. This is the confidence 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. All right, let's move on to the shoes. And um, read verse 15. Now take a look at those shoes. Look at those spikes underneath there. It's the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So verse 15 says... And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Feet. Let's see what the insight book says. Just one more, one more quote from them. A Christian's always being equipped and ready to make known the good news to others. That's what it means. 
doing so, despite hardships, can help him to endure faithfully. It's about being out in the field service, isn't it? It's about working. It's about those works again. That's all it said about. There's a lot to say about those, those shoes. You can could, could keep the shoes on if you want. Um, peace. Well, let's talk about that peace. It not only protects you, but it also protects us with a brutal weapon to wield against the enemy. And I found it interesting that there's two kinds of peace. Um, there's the peace with God, and there's the peace of God. Peace with God. When a person comes to God for salvation, that's peace with God, isn't it? After repentance, the old is gone, and there is peace. Peace of God. Colossians 3.15 says, And let the peace of God rule, rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. Rule. Well, that's taken from that word to portray an umpire in a game. An umpire, a referee, uh, one who judged the athletic games. So instead of anxiety and worry, we can say this. Let the peace of God call the shots in your life. Let the peace of God umpire your life and your actions. Let the peace of God referee your emotions and decisions. If he can't disturb your peace, he can't disturb you, right? How about those spikes? They look like they can do some damage, can't they? Maybe one to three inches long, they could have been on the bottom of that shoe. But what did they do? They helped the soldier in their footing in battle. They kept them in place. And what can we do? We can do some damage too. In a sense, we can also crush Satan under our feet. What is Romans 1620? How many times I've read this as a JW and just never, <laughs> never got the full grasp of it. Romans 1620 says, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Jesus completely destroyed Satan's power over, over you through his death and resurrection. His power lives in you today. And just as the roots of a tree are standing firm has a lot to do with our faith. You know, in the army of God, there are times of um, rest and refreshment. But there's never a time for complacency. Christians who let their guard down and get comfortable during a ceasefire will not be ready when the enemy comes in for the kill. That's why 2 Timothy 4.2 says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. This has been a challenge for me, peace of God, in the last eight, uh, seven years. Seven years. Tomorrow will be seven years since I accepted Christ. And um, six years ago, I gave my testimony, and I was all about um, getting everything back, what I lost from the witnesses. And the, the anger, of course, is still there, and maybe it's a little, little less today. Um, but we all talk about as witnesses what we lost. Lost family, we lost education, we lost our time, we lost our life, we lost everything on earth here, everything we lost. And, and so I, I still struggle with that. And when I was, I remember what I said up here, um, you know, I was going to college at that time, I'm getting everything back, I'm getting out of the cleaning business, you know. Um, but what I've been led to believe by the Lord in my heart is that he doesn't want me to go to college. Um, he wants me to draw closer to him and reach out to people that need him, the people that need Christ. And I need to get my priorities straight. That's what he has led me to believe and has rested on my heart. Because when we look at this nation and we look at this world and we see the conditions and we see the conditions of the churches, too, let's not leave them out. 
uh, there's a lot of work to do. That's why Jesus said, the harvest is great and the workers are few. I know what he means by that. We do need to get our priorities straight. And after all, I was working on a forensic science, forensic science degree. I don't think I really need that in heaven because there's no death there. So I think I kind of have settled that in my heart. Let's move on to the shield, verse 16. It says, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Well, the, sh the shield comes from the Greek word theron or theros, and it refers to a door that is... Um, long in length, wide in width, almost like a door. And what they would do is the soldiers would uh, take those shields and they would interlock them with the next soldier. And they would go as an army, almost like a tortoise shell. And they would go in for battle that they were completely covered, going and marching into war against the enemy. Very protected. Historically, a soldier was fitted for their shield, what they would wear, whether they were tall or short or, uh, you, know, you know, a little heftier, or, you know, whatever their stature was, they were fitted for that shield. It was also made of multiple layers of thick leather put on wood. And how they would care for it was interesting. It required daily maintenance to keep it soft and pliable. They'd use a little vial of oil and they would, it would, they would put it on the shield, and that would prevent it from becoming brittle and hard. And then they would soak it in water. Why? So that when those flaming arrows and those darts came, it was just extinguish the flames. Well, how can we apply that spiritually to us today? Romans 12.3 says, God has dealt... To each one, a measure of faith. Faith increases. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Does your shield have cracks in it? Most likely, we are not soaking our faith in the word of God. What about those fiery darts of the wicked one? Warfare. Arrows filled with combustible, explosive fluids. They look harmless. And when, but when hitting the target, they explode. You see these arrows coming, and they don't look too bad. But boy, when they hit that target, if they're full of explosives, isn't that what Satan does today? in our life? If he has no easy access into your life, he's going to try another more hidden way to get into your life, right? Let's move on to verse 17, and let's have a helmet up there, please. Yeah. It says, and take the helmet of salvation. Now, I've seen different helmets. I've seen this one. That looks really for battle. That looks good. I like that one. I picked that one out. But they also had um, a helmet with a plume on it. And um, that was kind of more for, like, ceremonies and parades. And, you know, it would also, the color would tell you what kind of rank of authority they had in the, in the army. And when we look at that helmet, and when you think of that plume, just talking about that plume, um, it was very attractive, the colors, you know, the, the ceremony. And isn't that what God's gift of salvation is? It's attractive. It's precious. It's beautiful. It's God's gift of salvation to us. Well, where does this word helmet come from? Nothing like paper and pen or well, it comes from the Greek word parakephalia, 
Parakephlia. Around the head. What does the devil come to attack us? What does he attack? Our mind. The devil comes to attack our mind, doesn't he? A person can become mentally and emotionally captive by the lies of the enemy and the unrealistic fears. Much today is said about identity, who they are. Personally, I struggle with this every day. Um, One example is um, I go to work and I clean every day. That's what I do for a living and uh, done it for 31 years. People look down on me, um, the way they talk to me. Uh, They give me the impression I can't do anything else. Um, And and, and hearing this enough times, I start to believe it, and at the end of the day, I'm I'm believing it already, you know, and I struggle with this. And for me then, I start getting angry. And then I start getting angry at God. And then I start getting resentment. And then my emotions get all messed up, you know. And again, it's the mind. It's like my armor's now falling off. I'm not focused. I'm not focused on the truth because the truth is I know my identity. I'm a child of God. My identity is in Christ. He delivered me from sin. He gives divine protection. He gives divine healing. He gives divine wholeness. He gives divine and complete soundness of mind. It doesn't matter how many years you've been saved. If you take that helmet off and stop walking in the knowledge of your salvation, then you're going to end up with a mind that is contaminated. And then the enemy is going to start hitting your mind. And he'll start hitting your emotions. The enemy has left his marks and his scars on all of us during the time we were under his control, hasn't he? I know he has on me. But now, as Colossians 1.13 says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Well, let's move on here to verse 17. And what does it say? Continue. It says, take up the sword of the spirit, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I love that sword. God's word. The sword is sharp on both sides of the blade. Where else have we heard that? Revelation 1.16, out of his, Jesus' mouth, went a sharp, two-edged sword. The term word is taken from Greek rima, which describes something spoken clearly, unquestionable, definite terms. Rima words are powerful. The Holy Spirit can quicken our hearts and our minds. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now listen, because I'm going to give a personal testimony with this. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I have been praying about a lot of things lately in my life right now. And, um, what else? Tissues, okay. Um, I went to a church recently, and, um, 
I never, it was a, a different church. I never saw the song before. Somebody, I think, wrote it. And um, one of the words to it was, I surrender to your design. I surrender to your design, Lord. I never saw those words before. And there was a battle in my mind. I can't say those words. I don't believe those words. I, don't, I can't accept those words. I don't believe they're true, and I'm not saying them to God. And that's what went through in my head. Stubbornness. But I knew they were true. I knew the words were true because they came from a loving God and a loving Father. I knew the whole concept behind it. I knew they were true, and I knew what they meant. But you know what? It was painful. It was painful to see them on the screen, and it was painful for me to say them and sing them. But you know what? It still had a good feeling. It felt good because what I was feeling was God's spirit. God's spirit was being active at that moment in my life. For me, that is what Hebrews is talking about. It's a piercing division of our soul and spirit. It's a discerner of our thoughts and our intents of the heart. So how do we conclude this? What does verse 18 say? The last picture, I think, has a... (laughs) He's fully dressed, standing, ready, on guard. Now, I didn't have a whole lot of time looking for pictures, so I don't know who the guy is there, and I don't know what the white things are, but what we're focused on here is 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 the armor and the soldier and the fiery darts and the missiles coming at him. That's what we're focused on here. Verse 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Praying. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. When is always? Always is always. Each and every time, each and every season, every possible moment. What kind of prayers? What kind of prayers are there? There's uh, petition, there's thanksgiving, there's supplication, there's intercession, prayer. How important to conclude that armor. So, are we fully dressed for battle? Are we? No? Are we sleeping? (laughs) Well, we know where, I know where I have to work on. And hopefully uh, something touched your heart here. Um, But one scripture I wanted to conclude with was in 1 Peter 5. And uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 8 through 11. It says, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen.